Well, hi, I'm John Deary, and welcome to our face-to-face -face series where we've always enjoyed talking with very experienced attorneys in particular specific uh, topics of the law. And today is a very important one dealing with workers' compensation generally. Uh, that's the area when someone is injured in a job setting and they're entitled to workers' compensation. But a specific area of workers' compensation has to do with individuals who have hearing loss as a result of their occupational environment. And uh, I couldn't be more delighted uh, to welcome an experienced, very capable uh, workers' comp attorney, uh, Scott Samuelson. And uh, Scott, delighted to welcome, uh, welcome you. And uh, let's begin. Uh, so we get a call from individuals. Some may have worked in construction, some in the uh, transportation field, some in uh, utility areas inside of powerhouses and they're complaining about a hearing loss. Uh, you get that call, what's the first thing you think about? Well, we get that question a lot. Um, the first thing that we think about is there's two types of hearing loss cases okay. under New York State workers' compensation law. Um, the first is a traumatic hearing loss, something like a loud explosion that knocks your hearing out in one accident. As you may imagine, um, those tend to be fewer and far between. Most of the people call and inquire as, as to what's called an occupational hearing loss case. That's the type of thing where a lot of construction workers or um, workers of that sort may be exposed to noise over time and over 20 or 30 years may lose their hearing over a period of time. That's called an occupational hearing loss type case. Generally speaking, so you're saying that the occupational classification of a hearing loss case is more frequent than the traumatic experience? We see that happening more often, at least that's the type of inquiries what we're getting, not, that we're getting. Not that the traumatic ones can't happen, but most people come to us after saying, hey listen, you know, I think I'm losing my hearing after 20 or 30 years of working on a construction site or working as a track worker for transit authority or something like that. And then they'll come to us and say, you know, is there a claim that can be made? So that's the type of, of inquiries that we get on a daily basis. What is the first step then that you both analyze and give recommendation to the client that calls about a hearing loss condition? Well, the first type of, we'll normally invite them into our office for a free of charge consultation. Okay. Um, and then what will happen is we'll get more of a sense as to what's going on with the type of hearing loss claim. Um, if the first type of thing that they tell us is it seems to be more of an occupational hearing loss claim, um, we have to see if the case is first ripe to file. Um, normally, um, you can't file a claim unless you're exposed at least 90 days in New York to loud noise. Most people don't have that particular issue. Um, but you also have to be removed from the noisy environment for at least 90 days before it's considered ripe to go forward on an occupational claim. If you have one of those loud exposure traumatic claims, those you can file right away. But on the occupational claim, the state basically wants people removed from the noisy environment for a period of time because, as you may imagine, if you could file these claims without being um, removed from that noisy environment, pe people's claims would be getting worse and they'd kind of kind of have to constantly revisit those sorts of claims on a daily basis. So, uh, What does that basically do? Suppose someone is working and continuing to work and yet feels they have a hearing loss. Uh, how do you get that removal from the 90-day period that seems like it's a requirement if a person is continuing to work? Well, there's two sorts of ways that you can do it. Um, most people to file those sorts of claims will um, wait for a point in their career where they are removed from the okay. noisy environment. A lot of times they'll wait until just after retirement where they know that they're not going to be exposed to that noisy environment and they can accomplish removal that way. Sometimes if somebody gets promoted, for instance, they were doing some sort of construction work for 20 or 30 years, but now they have a desk job doing management type of stuff for a company at that point, then maybe they can be removed from the noisy environment for 90 days. Um, if we can't get the injured worker removed from the noisy environment, what will wind up happening is um, it won't be considered ripe to follow through on the claim and then the indi individual injured workers are sort of in a tough spot where they might need medical care but it's not yet ripe to go forward with that sort of claim. The last way one can get removed from a noisy environment to file an occupational claim um, is using hearing protection. If, the, uh, if they can sort of swear on a stack of Bibles that they're put, putting on solid hearing protection and that they've never taken it off for the 90-day period. As you may imagine, that creates problems on cross-examination when these cases get 
um, controverted because um, it doesn't take long for a seasoned attorney to get the person to admit, and readily so, that they had to quickly take off the hearing um, protection to hear a conversation, and at that point, they haven't been removed from the 90 days, so it's not yet ripe to file. Uh, one of the issues that we talk about all the time here on Face to Face is uh, statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. How does that work with regard to a hearing loss case? Sure. Well, um, you're, uh, on a traumatic hearing loss case, it's the same statute of limitations of two years. But on an occupational claim, you have to first be removed from the noisy environment for 90 days and then the two-year statute of limitations. So really, it's two years and 90 days from the moment that you stopped being exposed to the noisy environment. Now, if, um, if there can come a point a, at a later point in time where people say, well, listen, it's been five or ten years, I think I, I, you know, am I out of the box on that sort of claim? The answer is not necessarily so. A lot of times we can find ways around the statute of limitations. And in fact, many times people five or ten years later, when they're first medically diagnosed with their hearing as being occupational hearing loss related, they still have 90 days to be able to file those claims, at least at a minimum. So a lot of times there can be exceptions to those rules. What would you view from a legal perspective, and of course a direct impact on the client, as the biggest obstacle in terms of making these filings? Is it what you had described before in terms of the 90-day period? Um, it's not as much a statute of limitation issue, although that's something that we do have to keep an eye on. A lot of times it's medical documentation. Um, what happens with these sorts of cases is, um, as you can imagine, most of these cases I mentioned are occupational in nature, mm -hmm. okay? And occupational claims in workers' compensation in general can, tend to be controverted more than um, an accidental claim. So, for instance, Let's take a hearing loss case as an example. If there's a loud explosion, chances are everybody at the job site knows about the loud explosion and people are more cognizant of the fact that somebody may have lost their hearing on that particular day. If you have one of those occupational cases um, that takes time, um, a lot of times what winds up happening is there's a question as to medical causal relationship. Just because somebody lost their hearing doesn't necessarily mean it happened on the job, and that's how the insurance companies defend against these cases. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's normally the case that any insurance company is going to take on this case, thinking like an insurance company because they're thinking, hey, let's face it, if this gentleman or lady does have hearing loss and it's not work-related, we don't have to pay as a workers' mm -hmm. compensation insurance sure. company. So they would prefer not to. Um, fortunately, the insurance companies, although they controvert these cases in the beginning, it's not the be-all and end-all. Um, to go forward in, with a case like that at the Workers' Compensation Board, we will need things like a medical report from the doctors, and oftentimes that can be the biggest obstacle. You're using a word controverted, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure I understand and anyone listening understands. Sure. Okay. Controverted is basically the insurance company simply saying, I don't think you or your client are entitled to those benefits. We don't want to pay. Okay. Okay. Now, you mentioned, because this goes through all kinds of personal injury matters, and that is, what kind of medical documentation is necessary here? And I'm thinking in particular because of the hearing loss, you have uh, medical doctors and then you have also specialists. So what kind of medical records are required? Yeah, um, a lot of people will come to us with a document, with sort of an audiogram normally done by an audiologist saying, hey, listen, I have hearing loss. And there's a certain range that we'll look to see if it's compensable for benefits that somebody will be entitled to. And they, th they say, hey, listen, this is proof of my hearing loss, and it very well may be so. Um, but I want to go forward with the claim based on you know what the audiologist says. Unfortunately, in our workers' compensation courts, it's not enough to go forward. We need a medical report, um, basically a medical doc doctor that okay. says um, that, your, that your medical report is um, causally related to your injury because it's the, the judges rely on the um, expert testimony of the medical witnesses. So okay. the audiologist won't do it alone, but the medical doctor's report is sufficient. And then you need something called prima facie medical evidence. A simple report, it can be a one-page written narrative from the doctor that says that the doctor examined the patient that the patient gave them a long history of 20 or 30 years working around loud noise, um, that they came in complaining of hearing loss, that the doctor or the audiologist at that point put them through um, a hearing loss test, um, and that they feel that there's medical hearing loss, and most importantly, the doctor's got to feel that within a reasonable degree of medical certainty, um, that hearing loss is causally related to the on-the-job injury. What happens in a situation, and I'm thinking in particular, for example, if someone worked in the construction field and worked for a number of different uh, employers, uh, 
how do you deal with that situation as to which employer may be liable? That's a good question, actually. What winds up happening is certainly if you have one employer, you file against the one employer and it's a non-issue. The workers' compensation law says that if in a situation like that where you maybe you're a union carpenter and you've worked for a variety of different people over your career, you file against the job with what's called the last injury ex exposure. In English, the last place that you were exposed to noise. Okay. And basically it's up to that insurance company to, they may ask the injured worker to sign medical releases and things like that to get proof as to where they worked. It's basically up to them to, in essence, implead or, or ask the other insurance companies that, to get relief from them if they ultimately become liable. They can get recovery from the other insurance companies depending on the nature and extent uh, and the length of, of uh, noisy exposure at some of those other jobs. What happens in the situation, again, I touched on it earlier, but I want to be clear, someone works, has a hearing uh, loss, feels they do, and yet continues to work during that period of time, maybe he's got five years or so to go before he retires, whatever the case may be. I think it's important to underscore that because I've heard a number of uh, cases where that situation seemed to be key. So person continues to work even though he feels or she feels that their hearing loss is, uh, is real. Yeah, a, a person can and should continue to work if at, at all possible with regard to that. Unfortunately, that can be a difficult spot to be in in an occupational hearing loss type of case because if we can't get an injured worker to the point where they're removed from the noisy environment, um, it, you really, it's not ripe to go forward on the worker's compensation and, and, and an injured worker may be faced with other means to get relief, you know, private insurance or things like that at, at, to go forward. It used to be under the workers' compensation law that you, were, you would still be able to file the claim, follow up on things like, like hearing aids and things like that and follow up on other benefits that an injured worker may be entitled to at a later point once they were removed. Unfortunately, the case law recently changed that and basically said in order to go forward on these cases now, you got to basically be removed in an occupational setting. Now, you mentioned a hearing aid is something that we're all familiar with. Sure. Uh, how does a hearing aid fit into someone with hearing loss uh, and who pays for it, for example? Because I know they're not, uh, they're not cheap. In, in, a, in, in a case that's ultimately established, I like to use that term instead of accepted because, as I mentioned to you before, we use the term controverted that you asked me to define. It's not uncommon for the insurance companies to fight these claims in the beginning. Once you convince a law judge that uh, the occupational hearing loss is compensable and that an insurance company has to pay benefits, um, the, the injured worker is required to go to, to doctors that accept workers' compensation as a means of payment and it becomes the workers' compensation carrier's responsibility to pay for not only the hearing aids but if and when they wear out, replacements of those hearing aids as well. At the end of the day, what, how do you analyze, since you've handled so many of these cases, how do you analyze the general perspective of the Workers' Compensation Board and the judges and hearing offices that deal with a hearing loss cases as compared to other kind of uh, workers' related injuries? Well, the, they take them very seriously. The judges are, you know, uh, uh, um, present a um, um, a forum where the insurance companies don't get their say at the end of the day. They're supposed to be an impartial forum where they hear these sorts of cases. Um, usually the whole procedure with something like that is um, the, an injured work, the first hearing itself, there's usually several hearings that go forward on these sorts of cases. Um, in order for somebody like me to bring a case like this, we really can't go forward until really the statute of limitations is satisfied, somebody's been removed from the noisy environment long enough for an occupational claim, and there's a medical report in order to be able to go forward with that sort of claim indicating that uh, the hearing loss is both compensable within the compensable range and also medically causally related to the, their job. Once all that's in order, we'll file a claim with the Workers' Compensation Board. As I mentioned to you, it's not uncommon and happens 90% of the time that the insurance company is going to controvert that case at the first hearing. The judge will then ask us, counselor, where's your medical evidence indicating that the condition is work-related? And at this point, we'll be like, right here, judge, and we'll hand the ju judge a copy of the medical report because mm -hmm. we know that's necessary to go forward and we don't want to be bringing any sort of frivolous claims mm -hmm. before the Workers' Compensation Board. Um, the judge will normally examine that report, determine that everything's in order, and if the judge does find that to be in order, the judge will adjourn the case for a trial where the injured worker will give what's called lay testimony. 
the insurance company will have an opportunity to bring in um, some, a coworker or a supervisor. Basically, the purpose of the lay testimony or the testimony of the injured worker, it's to paint a picture for the law judge mm -hmm. so that the law judge understands what it's like to be that person on mm -hmm. a daily basis. Sure. How long you've been doing this? What sort of things you know, are you doing that causes loud noise? What are you exposed to on a daily basis? How many breaks do you get? Things like that. And the insurance companies um, will have an opportunity to pr produce a witness on that as well. If everybody's being honest, the stories are fairly similar. Um, what we see in terms of a difference is the injured workers normally think that they're doing this more hours a day. They think they're doing this seven to eight hours a day. Um, most of the time the lay witness will say, well, listen, we agree that the person works around loud noise, but with breaks and everything else and with how um, each day can change on a daily basis, we think it's more to four or five hours a day. But either way, it gives the judge a pretty clear picture as to what it's like to be that injured worker. The judge will then normally give the insurance company an opportunity to get the uh, injured worker examined by one of their consultants. Now, if that consultant agrees that the condition is work-related, usually at that point, that's the end of the controversy because the insurance company's big defense is, hey, medically, this isn't related to on the job. If their own witness says, I disagree, it's related to an on-the-job injury, that kind of loses um, the, um, the strength of their defense, so to speak. Um, but if their doctor says more often than not, 70 to 80 percent of the time, anything from this guy doesn't have hearing loss to it's not related to I'm not sure that it's related, then we have a, a medical deposition where the doctors are deposed, um, sort of on a conference call in our forum, and a transcriptionist types up uh, mm -hmm. the testimony of the doctors. Um, and each doctor will be cross-examined and explain why, why the I guess the causal related basis of their opinion. Mm -hmm. And then the judge will make a determination on all of it all together. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's quite a process to go through, but mm -hmm. we tend to be very successful with those claims and injured workers shouldn't be dissuaded from following up on those claims if they feel they were hurt on the job because we personally feel that for every two or three of these cases that are really followed up on, there's probably about 10 more where people either don't know they have a claim mm -hmm. or aren't interested in following it all the way through given the defenses the insurance companies put up. One of the questions that I know clients are always asking us as attorneys about how long is this going to take? And I would just ask the question from the time a person may speak to you for the initial mm -hmm. uh, con uh, contact uh, until it is put into a file with the workers' comp and then from the workers' comp to generally speaking a resolution. So there's two kind of time periods. Roughly, generally speaking, what would you say is the time? I, I tell people in general to expect these days approximately a year before we get the initial resolution of the case, so to speak. Now that can take longer. If an injured worker sits down with me, says, I think I have this claim, and I tell them, listen, you need to produce a medical report saying your condition is work-related and they can't do that for you know nine months, well, then the process is going to take a lot longer than that. But if they can get us a medical report in fairly short order, um, filing the claim at the Workers' Compensation, Compensation Board can take several months. Litigation itself can take six to nine months. Um, and then the judge will make an initial determination. Of course, if that's appealed, which is anybody's right who's unhappy with the determination, the appeals process can take another year, uh, year to year and a half at the Workers' Compensation Board. But oftentimes, um, if there's a strong basis for an, an, uh, a determination, um, Many times the insurance companies don't appeal it after what the judge determines the first time if it's found in favor of an injured worker. Uh, each case is different though, depending on which adjusters you have on the file and which insurance companies you have on the file, so you can't quite hold me to that. But normally we're used to seeing a, um, a solid determination on the merits within a year, and um, many times it doesn't get appealed, but it can take up to a year or a year and a half more if there's this further appeal after. What constitutes in a hearing loss workers' comp, what constitutes benefits? Okay. Um, nor, there's two, in any workers' compensation case, you can, you can get financial benefits related to the claim. Um, it's possible to get weekly benefits of compensation if you're missing lost time due to an injury. Now, with a hearing loss case, that tends not to be the case because for the most part, as bad as somebody's hearing loss is, it doesn't usually get to the point where it's keeping them from working on a daily basis. What we're used to seeing is something called um, a, a cash award based on permanent hearing loss. And what happens is there's a form used by the Workers' Compensation Board, a C72.1, that kind of walks you through a calculation. 
And what happens is the doctor's doing a, an evaluation or, or an audiogram at the compensable hearing losses ra lost ranges. And I don't want to get into the complexities of the, of the calculation, but the long and the short of it is they basically take an average. It's a little bit more calculated than that. And that gets translated into um, a percentage of binaural hearing loss or bilateral hearing loss. Um, and that sort of ca enters into a further calculation where an injured worker can get a tax-free cash award even if they miss no time from work. And that's where we see most injured workers. I mean, even those that might be able to make an argument that the hearing's keeping them from working, um, there's another defense the insurance companies raise called uh, removal from the labor market where the injured workers basically to get weekly benefits have to keep looking aggressively for other work. Most of the time when we get to a, a hearing loss case, they feel that they, were that they have a compensable claim and they'd like to get benefits that they're entitled to, but many times they've finished their career, they've retired, they're not interested in looking for other work at that point. So for the most part, we're seeing um, cash awards based on uh, hearing loss cases. And finally, uh, I guess a question that always comes up as it relates to us as attorneys, is there any out-of-pocket expenses on behalf of the client who has had the hearing loss? And how is a legal fee calculated uh, so that uh, individuals can have some sense as they're entering or making some contact with an attorney what their own financial situation might sure. be? Sure. Uh, under the workers' compensation law, the attorney, the workers' compensation claimants' attorneys, people that do what I do for a living, we don't collect um, or, or make people pay money out of pocket to meet with us. In fact, all our consultations at my particular office will do free of charge and face-to-face -face so people can get some information free of charge and know where they're going with the claim. What happens in a workers' compensation case is the judges are technically um, the ones in charge of setting what they call a reasonable attorney's fee. And that's paid to us directly by the insurance company for the job. So in English, injured workers don't pay any money out of pocket for a consultation. Um, you can get all your information free of charge. The attorneys only get paid if they're successful with the claim. If they are successful with the claim, the judge sets the attorney's fee. These days, the judges are setting approximately about 15%, although you won't see that anywhere in the law. But I, you know, um, injured workers often pressure me. They, you know, if I tell them, listen, it's up to the judge, they don't know if it's going to cost them three cents or $30 million. So I'd give them a general idea that the judges these days are within that range so that they know approximately what reasonable judges are awarding these days. And they know that, that an insurance company is going to wind up paying that directly to the attorney so that they don't have to lay anything out of pocket with those sorts of claims. And therefore, it makes it you know, cleaner and easier to make people comfortable to meet with somebody like a workers' compensation attorney to find out about their rights. I think I said at the outset, a very experienced and knowledgeable attorney, and that, Scott, is exactly what you are. And thank you very much for this information. I think we put a lot of good, practical ideas uh, for anyone interested in a hearing loss case. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for your time, John.